Hi, my name is Kevin Thomas, W1DED. Today I have with me Patrick Bolin, KJ7ZSU. Patrick is the owner of Geocron. Geocron is the manufacturer of the colorful, popular display that many of you have seen in people's ham radio shacks. Geocron, amongst many things, shows you last contacts, DX spotting, gray line, maximum usable frequency, a number of different things. When I first was arranging this with Patrick, he made a point of saying, quote, I'm not the greatest ham radio operator. You know, I, I beg to differ because he is contributing in a pretty significant way with this product. I've watched it evolve over the years, and I'm really excited to have this chance to check with Patrick and find out how we got into the business, because that's very intriguing to me, but also where it's going to go from here. Patrick, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much, Kevin. So let's first establish where you are. I think you're on the West Coast, maybe Oregon or Washington. Yeah, the whole thing started in, uh, well, back in 1964, the whole thing started down in the San Francisco area. And then about 20 years ago, it moved to Portland, Oregon. And then I found it 10 years ago. And right now I'm speaking to you from my home just across the river, which is in Camas, Washington in the Portland, Vancouver area. So I'm actually in the state of Washington right now. So Patrick, I'm really intrigued about how you got into this business, um, partly because of my own business background, but I, I know enough about your story that it's, it's pretty interesting. But before we do that, why don't you give our listeners a little bit better definition of what Geocron is, not only from a ham radio standpoint, but also the other uses beyond ham radio. Geocron started out as this really elaborate world clock, which we still make today. Uh, and back in the day in 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, it was the only place that ham radio people could see in a graphic display, the gray line in real time, such as being distributed uh, shown, shown behind me here. And so it got, it was sort of like this marketed as the king of the shack and Ronald Reagan gave one as diplomatic gifts and all that kind of stuff. So over time, uh, as the internet came over, a lot of those tools to see where the maps were and where the sun was shining and the INOS, that was all happening uh, online. And so the clock began to fade out of, uh, out of memory. And that's when I came into it. So before we get to that, who was the brainchild behind the original product? So Dr. James Kilberg, his first invention was the rotary dial on the analog phone, like, right? And he invented this elaborate machine that would kind of like do like a finger motion and dial the phone. And so he sold that device uh, in the early 60s to another company, and then he used this money to develop uh, Geochron. The reason why was because his wife went on a vacation to Luxembourg, and she, he called, she called him in the middle of the night to the west coast of California and said, uh, uh, hey, how you doing? I just wanted to catch up with you. And she had no idea what time it was. So he thought, you know, there really needs to be a clock that shows what time it is all around the world at the same time. And so the Geochron in its basic level is a 24 hour time zone clock. That is the most basic thing that it does. He invented this and then he went to a local airline. I think it was American Airlines. And he said, uh, hey, I'll build you. Uh, this is what I've got. This would look great inside of your inside of your rooms. It's where people are waiting for your planes. Uh, how about you buy a bunch from me? And they're just like, we like it. Um, do you have 47 of them? And he said, no, but if you pay me up front, I'll have it for you in six months. And that's how he started the company. That's a great story. So 10 years ago, you discover the company. They're still making mechanical clocks. The internet still yes. is yeah. flying at that point. What did you see a value in a company that was making mechanical clocks in an internet age? Oh, Oh, I owned one. So <laughs> I was, it's one of these passion projects, right? So I first saw a Geochron when I was in my middle career, when I was working as a construction manager and uh, I walked into a boardroom and I went, what? And I was looking at a mechanical Geochron, of course, because I had not yet invented the digital one and uh, thought, well, I really want one of those someday. And then, so some years later I had Moved on to my third career, which was I had a small business. It was doing pretty good. I'm like, I'm going to reward myself with a Geochron mechanical clock. And I found one on eBay. It was broken. And I'm like, oh, I, got big, I got a garage. I can fix that thing. So he came over. I, could, I got the clock and we set it up on the wall. And it worked pretty well, but it was kind of bent and damaged. And it was really tough moving the dials. It had obviously been used quite a bit by someone 
for years and I didn't even know where it came from except eBay in Florida. So uh, I looked online and I'm like, well, I need to get this fixed because I love this thing. We, and I discovered that the only location on earth where geochrons were made and restored, the mechanical ones, was just a mile from my house. So I was like, I threw it in the back of the car. Whereas normally you have to like get it into a UPS box, order the shipping container, do this whole process. I just threw it in the back of my car and drove like a mile to this business complex uh, and said, hey, uh, this is my clock. Do you have... Um, I, I think I need a front plate repair kit. And they're like, yeah, come on in. And so they said, uh, they put it down. They turned it upside down. They looked at the serial number and the an, an older woman said, all right. And there were maybe four employees that were there. Well, let me go check out to see where this is, has been. So I'm getting a tour of the shop, which is about 5,000 square feet. And and she comes back and she, well, she goes into this little room that has a bunch of little card files that are all over, like, like, like library card files files and then she pulls out this one and she comes back and she's holding this card file and she says okay well i've got this uh i've got this uh my card your card right here so this clock was made in uh 1987 it was sold to a, an it company in new england and then it came back in 1992 for a map a new map and uh then we lost track of it but here it is and i just i don't know if you've ever had that moment Kevin but I just I just fell in love with the thing right then I mean like we all have phones there's a million of these out there we've got all uh, just 10,000 everything's plastic nothing is has a personality but that clock did and so uh that's two months later I bought the company that's the best story and the reason why was because like it's yeah the reason why I bought it was because two months within that time, as they were giving me a walk around, uh, I have a lot of experience with small business and I could see that they needed help. It was sort of a dying kind of a situation and they needed a fresh a fresh perspective. So uh, I took the clock back. We hung it on the wall. We drank wine. We toasted it. This is a great looking clock. But then two months later, I drove back to the company. I said, hey, I, um, I flagged down the owner. We sat down in our office. I closed the door. I said, I get it. The Geochron is fantastic. I really love it. And she's like, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And an older woman. And uh, like, she because it's all the time. But I said, hey, if you were ever interested in selling this company, I would like to be a part of that conversation. And she said, uh, what, 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 what was your name again? <laughs> so uh, I had her on a hook. I asked how much it was worth. And after some discussion, they came up with a number and it was not something that I had enough cash for, but nobody would give me money for it because it was just an idea and a bunch of parts. And so um, eventually I did buy the company from them uh, later that year. And they, they gave, they held the loan on the company and uh, with a big payback in three years, like if I sunk, then actually they would, I gave them uh, a lien rights on uh, a house that I owned because that was sort of my, that was the, that was the balance of the payment there. So I didn't have to sell the house. I'd made enough money to pay them back. And then as soon as I did, we started to develop the digital version. So the company starts in 1964, you buy it 10 years ago. Was it still in the same family? It had been in the same, same family until it came up to Portland, but the original Geochron, uh, Dr. Kilberg's son, <clears throat> his two sons actually, maintain contact with me just to make sure the clock is doing okay. They've been up to the, uh, they've been up to my shop to put their hands on the tools and go, Oh yeah. All right. They're elderly now. But, uh, anyway, it's a, it's a delight to see the thread pass all the way to me. Somehow, Kevin, I think I was chosen to do this. I don't know. So give me some perspective on what that was, what the company looked like 10 years ago. How many, how many clocks were they shipping a year? What was their volume? Were they profitable? Yeah, it, <clears throat> it was very profitable in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Uh, and I'm just going to guess if there were, um, I think there were maybe a total of 40,000 mechanical clocks that were made in that time period. So if I could guess, they were probably shipping about a thousand a year. Uh, and when Reagan gave one to Gorbachev as a diplomatic gift, when he first visited the United States, sales went up for that. Uh, they would get the geochrom placed in notable locations, but, and they had, they did a lot of advertising in the sky mall magazines. Remember those old magazines on planes and, uh, I'm dating myself there, but, uh, and so that's how geochrom got around mostly just, you know, wealthy, well-traveled people and ham radio people who wanted to see the gray line. 
in real time. So were ham radio operators buying the mechanical clocks at, at a pretty good volume back then? Yeah, they were. When I took over the company, it didn't take me long to discover that ham radio was probably, as far as the mechanical, was probably a quarter of my audience. Uh, for the digital clock, it's ham radio is half my audience because it's so much more affordable. So only because I, I think I know some of the backstory, um, they didn't necessarily greet you with open arms. I I heard a rumor that maybe they even <laughs> locked you out of the building at one point. Is that true, Patrick? Oh, you found out about that, yeah. Uh, the I, I bought the company, They and then they introduced me to the employees. They just, they just dropped it on them. Like, here's Patrick sitting at the break table, and so he's going to take over the company, and I'm going to stick around for a couple months and teach him how to do the thing, and you guys are great. We'll see you later. And so the employees did not like that. Uh, they they felt that the company was doing really well because of their efforts, but in truth, the, com- the company, when I purchased it, was hemorrhaging money. And so I came in and I started looking at vendor relationships, looking at who we needed and who we did not. And uh, and there was some change that went on and uh, it, 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 it turned into a, a little bit of a... Uh, an undercover bar fight. It, it, not that, not that they did. They did lock me out of the, the building once. Uh, it was, it was snowing, and I was standing out there, and I had ridden my bike into work because you know it's just a mile away from my house, and I'm like, and they wouldn't know. They and then finally, I had to sort of call and say, "Will you please let me in? I told you to keep this door unlocked." <laughs> but I tried to be as kind as possible, and at one point, I brought back the owners to explain the condition of the company when I bought it to justify, Hey, I think the person that you're angry with is not me, but it's the, it's your, it's your previous supervisors and, um, God bless them because they did a great job and they had bailed out the company, uh, by themselves, right? If it wasn't for them, Geochron would not exist by the time I got to it. Uh, but this had been a passion project for them that kind of wore out. And then it turned into a passion project for me. And thank goodness, uh, the mechanical still exists and the digital kind of saved the boat. So that's how it rolled. So I presume that was the case. So you introduced the digital product and that was part of the turnaround financially. Yeah. I think if you've ever been a business owner, uh, you've all, you've all had that moment where you opened up the, the uh, you looked at your accounts who you needed to pay and you didn't have enough money in the checking account. And so that happened. I, I did a few things at the very beginning and we sold a bunch of clocks. And then after six months, the, uh, the honeymoon period wore off and, and I ran out of money. And so I had been going to trade shows and taking the clock to people. I wanted to hear people's response to the clock. And basically what they told me was uh, everybody who was older than me just thought the clock was really great. And they all loved the, the mechanical charisma of the whole thing. That was cool. But, and then I said, well, how much does it cost? Oh, you know, two to $4,000. And, and they were like, oh, rah, 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 rah. and then everybody younger than me was like, is, is that digital? Is that a screen? No, it's not a screen, I said. Don't you feel the mechanical charisma of this clock? Yeah, how much does it cost? Two to $4,000. No, no, no. And then they just walk away, right? And I thought, really got to get a digital one going here. <laughs> so the, the story was, um, I was uh, fishing through YouTube one night at home. And on my YouTube feed, there was a guy that had created a, a Ute, uh, like a, 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 a dirty geochron in a digital picture frame using the circuit board in the back of the picture frame. And he was kind of, he was a programmer and he kind of made this rough gray line. And there was the, there, there was the geopolitical map and he, it was dirty, but he had the right idea. And I thought, that's what we need to do. That guy knows how to do it. Like I'm watching this on YouTube. And, uh, and so I found the guy and he was a professor in upstate New York. And, uh, I called him on his uh, his faculty phone and I said, uh, Hey, this is Patrick at Geochron. I left a message like this. I'm like, this is Patrick at Geochron. And you're not in trouble. I just want to talk to you about how you did that thing. And can you give me a call back? <laughs> he's like, he's, and so he called me back and we worked together for a year and we put together uh, basically a copy of the mechanical clock. And, but um, he, he put it up on a screen and he showed me on the screen. And I'm like, that's it. That's it. But it didn't look very good. And I'm like, he goes, it's kind of fuzzy. I'm like, we'll put it on a 4K screen. And so he did. And then he went, oh, and that's what that's what makes the beautiful, 
beautiful, beautiful glittery stuff that goes on with Geochron because what the market and what the tech, what Geochron was waiting for was the technology of 4K to be ubiquitous, which it is now. And that's why it works because Geochron tried this in the 80s and they had sort of a basic screensaver program that showed some gray lines and weather and some basic stuff, but it was just in a browser window, uh, like Safari and, uh, it, and it didn't look that great, but put that thing on 4k and it's gorgeous. So Patrick, was it that simple though? I mean, it's, it's easy to look back and say, you found the guy, he was a programmer, 4k. <laughs> and you know, if, if I close my eyes for a second, I'm, I'm picturing your shipping within four months. Was that what happened? Uh, nothing was simple about this, but I was chosen to make it happen. I really believed in it. My wife would later say, Patrick, I wish, uh, I, I wish I had been a better helpmate to you to tell you that Geochron was a bad idea because it was killing me. And, uh, but honey, I don't think you would have listened. <laughs> and it's probably true. I was really into it. The way it went was um, we had the software going for a basic Geochron, but didn't know how to to put it. I didn't know how to deliver it to people, right? You put it on a, you, you, am I going to put this on some sort of a USB stick? And then they load it into their, their program, all of this. I'm not a developer. There was a lot of research that needed to be done and some questions to be asked. Um, what we decided in the end was to use a small x86 computer that we could get affordably. And so we ordered a bunch, like these little set-top boxes that are streaming boxes that you see. Um, we ordered a bunch from 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 Amazon just and tried them, maybe a dozen of them. And then we found them one that worked. We figured out who the manufacturer was. I ordered 100 from the manufacturer. It was overseas. And then I got 100 and we loaded it and it seemed to be okay. And then I sat down, and this is like six months process. And then I sat down and wrote an email um, a, a, on our newsletter, which said, "Finally, a Geochron for everyone." And I had a hundred to sell. And I let that newsletter out on a Friday afternoon. And by Monday morning, I was sold out. And I was like, "Ah, I knew it! I knew it! I've got something! I've got something here!" So it was just, uh, it was just, yeah, the same people that were making the mechanical clocks were helping me box these computers and sending them out and they looked reasonable. Uh, and those version ones still exist. And if you've got one, somebody out there has one, I'd love to hear from you. We still repair them. Uh, and the version one was underwritten by Android, an Android operating system. Version two, which is that same fact form factor is underwritten by Linux, um, and uh, but those people who bought the first hundred, that's super awesome. I just really appreciate that because you started the fire. Well, Patrick, I, I really enjoy the backstory, the business story. But let's move on into the ham radio product since we have a ham radio audience. How has the the ham radio product evolved over the past, let's say, four or five years? And and where do you think it's going to go in the future? Well, you probably don't think where it's going to go. Where yeah. do you plan on taking it in the future? Yeah, we've made some big steps in the last uh, 12 months. I'm going to share a couple screens uh, with you uh, so that you can kind of see the evolution of the whole thing. I'm just going to take a second to set that up. Hold on. In the beginning, uh, you should all rec you should recognize this. This is your basic ham radio map uh, with all your different ITU zones, right? And so this is the same map that we were using in one of the versions of our mechanical clock. It's just a giant PDF. We'd put that into a Geochron. And what we've done now is turn that into, uh, and I'll just jump ahead now, three years. And here's what we've got going on. So in this map, what I'm looking at, and I'm going to jump in close here, is you see um, uh, DXing that's occurring. And these are all color banded. And so you can tell by what color by looking down here at the bottom. And there are the antennas that these people are using. And what we're doing is we're going into the back of an old Telnet network and we are picking up what people are logging and getting it to people's geochrons within about five minutes so that people could see what the real time is uh, as far as who's talking to what and where. Uh, and then you can also see there are ham radio satellites that are selectable that are swimming around in the atmosphere at five miles a second. These uh, these little circles are different are little earthquakes that are that are happening. Some of them small, some of them uh, pretty big. And then uh, we have the International Space Station, and I think that's down oh down here in the corner. Well, maybe you can find it over here. There it is, right over here, the ISS. So. This is part of the product that we started developing for ham radio guys because the Geochron 
is a fantastic way to take a look at the world in in real time all the way across. Here is another version of that. So this is a super busy screen because it's got the maidenhead grid that's laid over it. Uh, but you can get down into for down into within the grid, you can see who's talking from that grid. As far as uh, you see the the great circle routes that are being established here, and that's KV six LF. Um, and anyway, so it can really get overpowering how much is going on. And here's why the geochron became so important uh, in the mechanical version is because, as you know, the ionosphere in twilight becomes much more reactive. And so here is the gray line here. And wow, look at all the transmissions that were happening, uh, that are happening between Europe and South America, because that's where the gray line is. And you can see if I go down here that 20 meters, that yellow here, you can see 20 meters, is particularly hot when I took that screenshot. And well, that was two years ago. So since then, we've added zooming and NOR overlays. We've added CQ overlays and, uh, and just released a few weeks ago, a major weather package. So this is what we've got. Oh, I forgot to mention over here in the corner, all of these, um, this should look familiar to you. The solar conditions, position of the planets and the polar forecast, which isn't in this, but that's also included too. So that's just like the, that is the, that's the two minute version of all the stuff that's on the ham radio bundle. So Patrick, one of the things that comes to mind is how difficult is this to set up? I, I think it, I think it's customizable and I can choose which layers to have show up on my screen. How difficult is that? Sure. Um, so to start with the hardware is, uh, it looks like this. So this is a Wi-Fi antenna. This is an ethernet. And then this is, should look familiar. This is the HDMI port that plugs into your TV. So this is how we decided to distribute this. My brother gave me some really great advice. He said, don't sell it inside of a TV. You don't want to get into selling TVs because they take up space. So what we have is if you buy a Geochron, you get a box and it's got this little powerful computer on the inside of it. You could think of it as a laptop without a screen. And then it's operated by this remote control. So the remote control is up, down, left, right, okay. And it was in, we are in 2024, we're working towards developing a, a new program. We'll keep the remote, but wouldn't it be cool to operate that elaborate screen through a remote control that is an app on your smartphone? And we've already done the design process for that remote. All I have to do is go up, up, down, down. I want to see this, 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 and select and okay. And then a few seconds later, boom, it appears on your geochron in front of you. And so that's just where we've grown up because we've kind of outgrown these little things. I'm constant. Even us, we're constantly sitting there going up, 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 down, down, down. Okay, 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 okay. Left, 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 right. And trying to navigate the menu. Um, we're really excited about a, a, a remote app to work this really a complicated, complicated machine. The setup, Patrick, how, how difficult beyond hooking it up to my TV, um, how difficult is it to establish the right telnet connection um, to upload my ADI logs if I'd like to do that? Yeah, let me show you an example of what that looks like. Um, here's an example of uh, one of the menus. All right, so inside the, when you press a button on the remote, the menu will appear and there are multiple levels to the menu that you navigate left to right. And for the one that the DX, uh, the, for DXing is, is most interesting is uh, you'll go down and you'll, you'll pick left, right, and then okay to turn on the different toggle buttons. And so, and then down at the bottom, you'll press okay to select, and then it will appear on the screen. So there's no configuration as you refer to that needs to happen uh, in the thing, except you need to get it connected to your Wi-Fi network or plug it into Ethernet, and that requires using an on-screen keyboard to plug it in and uh, and to go. Oh, I want here's my Wi-Fi password, and then once that's done, everything else is operated by left, right, up, down, and OK. So no particular, nothing serious like trying to enter in IP addresses and all that kind of stuff. And what about upgrades? Um, you you had mentioned earlier that you were you're upgrading the software. Are those included with the base price or are those an extra charge? 
Sure, that's a great question. So um, every Geochron that, that is sold will receive data for its lifetime in a couple different categories. The satellites, where they're at, the gray line, where it's at, the different maps. There's a ham radio map, topographical map, geopolitical map, that's there. Um, some basic weather that would come from NOAA, and that would be like cloud cover and where it's precipitating on Earth. As long as you get any Geochron plugged into the network, into your network, I'm gonna. it's gonna call out to my server and it's going to deliver all that stuff for free. But what we found out was that providing stuff for free is a great way to go out of business. So for specific audiences like ham radio, uh, we charge a subscription for that stuff. And um, so for ham radio in particular, and I, I don't have a great screenshot to show you the, the, the stuff that's there, um, that's uh, $8 a month, $8 a month, I think, 69 bucks a year to have all that constant DXing in that. That would include all the solar weather, that would include the call signs, uh, also include CQ and ITU overlays, and one important thing that comes with any premium layer, and that's zooming. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, Anybody who does zooming gets it. And this will be a nice segue into uh, the talking about the weather package that we just put out. So I, just a moment. All right. So one thing that people, every, everybody has said, could you please, uh, how come I can't zoom on this? Because they're used to being on Google Maps or on their phone. And uh, they're going to pinch and they get closer to the map that they're looking at. And with Geochron, it was fixed in a global Mercator position. But here, uh, so after a couple of years, we figured out that we need to start zooming. And so we started putting together a big zoom package. So if you can imagine, I don't think I have a picture of it. Oh, I do actually, here it is. Nice. All right, so here's Europe using a CQ overlay. Uh, showing different uh, DXing that's going on. And this is the whole of Europe. It looks a little dark because the gray line is over here uh, coming across the Atlantic Ocean. So the zooming is a feature that we're developing every month. Right now we have America, North America, we have Europe, we have Australia, and uh, we're gonna be rolling out uh, a new zoom region on the planet every month throughout 2024. And so uh, that comes with any premium package. And as I mentioned, uh, the weather, <clears throat> now we have tied in, uh, we're in cooperation with Eris. Uh, we have much more detailed weather, but it costs us money to get this kind of data, that kind of tracking that you see down here and all that. So uh, here's another example of what that looks like for Europe, right? Wave height, temperatures, radar, where it's snowing, where it's raining, all that stuff costs money. So, uh, so we are providing that to as another premium layer uh, for seventy nine dollars a year. And then there's also a just like I want it all. And that's ten bucks a month. You get all the data that we that we have at ten bucks a month. So, for a better illustration of that, you would go to Geochron uh, and just look at premium layers, and they're all listed out for you right there. And Patrick, give me an idea of how many of these are in use in the ham radio community today. You know, I take about three thousand. I'll just put a number out there. Maybe, maybe two to three thousand. I think would be a fair number. Um, and the ham radio bundle is our most popular bundle. Uh, so, and then, but we're 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 working on we're doing more with weather. Uh, we just this actually two days ago we just added new layers to the to the ham radio bundle, and that would be. Ooh, I have a great picture of that. Um, just a moment. And that would be our uh, the moon because people are asking to see the moon all the time, and of course we could do that because we could do it for the sun. So the moon, where the moon is shining, is illustrated by the purple. Uh, here is Africa. There is the International Space Station, and then there is the gray line that you see up here in real time. And so we're always working on the ham radio bundle. We always and but so that we can uh, have people who keep the subscription and add to the subscription. The thing that I have seen with uh, with Geochron is that uh, we get beautiful pictures of people who have it in their shack. And here's an example of what that looks like over here. And wow, they've spent a lot of money. People walk into the door and look at their shack and they go, gee whiz, that's a, that's a lot of equipment, but they don't know what they're looking at. But as soon as the, the operator points to the Geochron, they'll be like, oh, oh, oh. And then they use it as a tool, not just to see where what's going on in real time around the world, but to explain what the heck they're doing in the middle of the night. So this has been a, uh, so anyways, ham radio is still a big audience for us. 
Well, I know that latter point very well because I have one in my my shack and it does attract a lot of attention. Nobody wants to look at the K3, the uh, TS-990. They look at the map, They, but it becomes a great entry point into the rest of the dialogue. Patrick, I really appreciate you joining me today. You've got a fantastic product. I, I'm really impressed with what you've done with the company so far, and I, I can't wait to check in with you another five or 10 years to see where you've taken it. If, you're, if you've shipped two to 3,000 in the ham radio community, obviously that market um, is much bigger a lot of room for growth. I presume you're, you're shipping internationally. And that brings me to the final point. How does somebody buy this? Sure. So um, in the ham radio community, we have uh, a couple of, uh, we have a number of dealers, about a half a dozen different dealers. Uh, if you go to a major a website that has ham radio stuff, I wouldn't stop you from doing that. You can also find it on our website at geocron.com. Thank you, Patrick. I've been talking to Patrick Bolin, kj 7 ZSU, the owner and president of Geocron, creating a fantastic product for ham radio. Please go to his website and check it out. Patrick, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much, Kevin.